card for admin. You want to be able to get over to those higher ink tolls and the five ink and six ink so you get access to things like Madame Medusa and ultimately things like Be Prepared in the later game. If you discard too early, too often, you'll find yourself with no cards in hand at somewhere four to five ink and you're in a very, very bad position if that is the case. We do see Bucket coming down. Everybody's favorite squirrel here. Yeah, we saw no play from Edmund there on turn two. Probably another reason to cash in that uh, turn box followers as well. Maybe trying to find something to do here on the turn two, but nothing to be found there. And as you said, Bucky coming down for Kevin on turn two here. Does he have... Does he have the shift? Does that he have the, the shift here behind us? Yeah, I was going to say the dreaded turn two play. Look, he's taking this long. Either either he's got it, he's slow rungers. I think that is a Diablo in his hand. Maybe he's deciding what he wants that to absolutely discard. absolutely is an enchanted Diablo right. with an... Uh, a discard target in hand, so we're going to see that perfect opener from Emerald Steel. It's going to be a discard trigger for Edmund Chu. Not what Edmund wanted to see in this matchup, but at least it's with Edmund on the play. Can you imagine if he just didn't have the Diablo ship there? It was just making him sweat it out the whole time? That's like some mental warfare from Kevin's side here. But the perfect answer with a two-for-one brawl from Edmund's side, that's why you see the disparity of being on the play. Edmund answers it immediately with that two-for-one on the brawl. That's a perfect position to be in. We do see an Aladdin come down here. And that's going to go ahead and trigger the Bucky, being a Floodborne. Another copy of Brawl. Yep, Redundant Brawl cannot target Aladdin. Aladdin does have three strengths, so he's an easy discard. And I think we're going to see one of these friends on the other side. Oh, we do have a Rabbit as well. That's very, very good. So we're going to ink this friends on the other side. We are likely going to play the Rabbit. Oh, we're actually going to play friends on the other side. Okay, insulate the hand. I like that. So it does know what to prioritize here. It knows that this is a game where he does want to go long and prioritize the card draw over anything else, doesn't want to get that potentially discarded on this following turn. How do you like inking that Maui here as well? Is that something that maybe doesn't shine as much in this matchup? Um, it's okay. It can dominate the board, and it can trade very, very well. That being said, it's not core, It's not part of your core game plan of what's going to actually help you win this game. We do see another brawl enter the banish zone there for Edmund as the Donald Duck comes down. Donald Duck is a symmetrical effect. Your opponent may draw as well, but you will see these Emerald Steel players actually manipulate that and will allow you to draw, but then make you discard that card. Look, there's that rabbit you are talking about from Edmund Chu as well, going ahead and keeping that hand total as high as he possibly can for how many times he's had to discard here this turn. So it does look like we're going to get the double draw from Kevin here. Yeah, double be prepared in hand. We did see Edmund actually choose to get rid of the Brawl, which is an inkable card, over one of the be prepared. So actually prioritized it in a sense and having it in hand. Very interesting to take note as we progress through this game. Is it that important in this matchup that you have to make sure that you have one? No, it's not. It's important when it's important, and when it's not important, it's one of the worst cards in your deck by far. So if you can't get up to 7 ink and you can't utilize that card, it can also get snagged by Ursula. Um, it is one of the worst cards because getting up to 7 ink in this matchup, not a guarantee, Tana, not at all. Yeah, with as many triggers off of Bucky as we're going to be seeing here, I've got to believe that there, it's it's going to be, if he gets up to 7 ink, he might not have anything left to use seeing once an, he gets there. Yeah, seeing another Diablo scary, and now I feel like this Be Prepared is very good to answer your question because that is going to that is going to really help us against this Diablo. We've got to find Inkables, we've got to keep Inking, and we have those two B-Prepared. So we even have a backup against the Ursula, and a B-Prepared on this board is going to be critical. Yeah, I see a big Sisu as well. Not to mention, that is a second Rabbit as well from Edmund Chu, something that could be very important in this matchup, is do your cards replace themselves? We've seen this return box followers into the double Rabbit here, and this is important in this matchup, right? Dang, as we progress through this game, all I can think is Edmund is so good. <laughs> yeah. He's just making such good plays. Like, uh, it's it's incredible. We're setting up for a perfect be prepared here. Double Merlin Rabbit on the board. Going to clear this Diablo, this Donald, uh, this Donald Duck, as well as the Bucky, and just have double card draw after that, as well as a backup be prepared if Kevin does deploy more to this board. Kevin progressing to that 10 lore, progressing that win condition, but only three cards in hand after inking this. So Edmund's going to be vastly up on cards at that point, and we're going to lose many of these really relevant threats. Yeah, big ink advantage here for Kevin, 10 to 1 on Edmund Shoes. But that's not necessarily what's important right now in this game. It's just going to be, can Edmund take care of this board? And like you were saying, there's double be prepared in Edmund's hand. That's a good spot to be in here because one Ursula is not going to get it done. And it looks like a pass over. Do you think Kevin maybe senses the be prepared is coming here? Um, potentially, but that, I mean, I think that's almost certainly why he didn't deploy at all onto that board. That being said, the beep red is still good, right? Because mm -hmm. Kevin's working with four cards in hand. The Diablo did trigger, but Edmund's going to have after this. So we have one, two, three, four, five cards in hand. We're going to play the beep repair, and then we're going to draw two cards. We're going to have seven cards in hand. After the ink, it's going to be six. I mean, we're just ahead on cards. We're ahead on value. The opponent's only on 10 ink. We're in a good spot as the Ruby Amethyst player here. Yeah, and speaking of being good spots, two more cards get added to Edmund Chu Sander. I think I saw the fourth copy of Brawl as well in his hand, just in case Kevin does maybe get back in this game with one of those building up his boards like it was earlier that Brawl's going to take it. But it looks like just a Tinkerbell from Kevin here for no extra value on that damage. 
and then does also have that spicy tech of the ACOS uninkable Sisu, what can often be a one-sided B prepared against Emerald Steel. That being said, does not hit the Tinkerbell, which is sort of dominating the field right now. So it's interesting to see Tinkerbell also insulating Kevin against like a castle play that Edmund could drop. Tinkerbell will be able to provide a relevant amount of damage counters onto that castle. Nevertheless, we are going to pay for him. We are going to see that castle come down, a tempo-oriented play here. Yeah, absolutely. Possibly getting him some extra cards feature. Definitely getting him extra lore here. Something that sometimes the Emerald Steel decks have a hard time dealing with. You have to attack it multiple times with a bunch of different things as well. Yeah, and a lot of Emerald Steel's um, characters do not have high strength, so they can't even deal with it efficiently whatsoever. We do see the Goat Chem done as well. So this Tinkerbell has to most likely... It's also good. So it, in terms of tempo, it is going to likely slow Kevin down in terms of progressing his win condition and questing up because he needs to deal with the castle. The castle on its own, getting two lore per turn, is not that threatening. But once you attach a character and it starts drawing an additional card per turn, that is extremely threatening. Yeah, Kevin's going to go ahead and lore up here with his Tinkerbell. I think Kevin knows how he wins this game, and it's not through attrition, so it's going to take the aggressive route, and it's now the beatdown in this matchup. We do see five pay. There is a Robin, a Robin Hood there, champion of Sherwood, as well as the one drop to follow it up. Are we going to see another be prepared out of Edmund Chu here? I believe does has the second hand. This looks like a prime board to be prepared. You're going to have that castle in the back of just sitting there, and Kevin surely won't be able to do much about it. Hey, can we talk about how impressive Edmund's hand is from here? He's got be prepared. He's got big Sisu. He's got Maui. He's got all the big, hateful Ruby cards they are going to be able to take care of stuff. And look, it, look, he doesn't even feel like he needs to use it to be prepared. Maui's going to come down, take out that Tinkerbell, still be on the board, threatening to maybe take care of something else if it's not mm. challenged into. I really like what Edmund's doing here. Edmund's prioritizing, so he deals with the, the high-strength character in the form of Tinkerbell, and it's just deploying further onto the board. Very, very interesting. So we have the Robin Hood, the Robin Hood champion of Sherwood, who can trade with the Maui and actually draw an additional card. There is a trigger there. We'll also uh, gain a lore. So if it's banished in a challenge, it does draw that card. That is relevant. But Edmund's board looking pretty healthy. The thing is, Kevin is up to a pretty high amount of lore in the form of 12 and threatening 15 on this turn. That's with four additional cards in hand, one of which being one that cantrips in the form of Let the Storm Rage On. Yeah, I see another Tinkerbell here is where a second Bucky was added to hand here from the one that was earlier. Does Kevin have any of those really ridiculous turns here that he can set up? Tinkerbell can do some some massive things, but we'll have to see. Where does he want to start? Let's start with the, Let the Storm Rage on. And you're a pretty big fan of starting with the cards that draw an extra card, right? Absolutely. It's uh, So not in this case is it objectively correct, but if you do have the opportunity to draw before you make a relevant decision like inking or playing cards from your hand, it is always correct to have more infor information rather than less, which sounds very simple, but it is more <laughs> is more complicated than that. And this is actually a pretty strong play, it's, it's especially in the terms of taking the aggressive line. It does go ahead and shift that second Robin Hood. It's going to quest all the way up to 16. That's a very scary amount to be facing against. We're going to go ahead and ink that Bucky, which I do think is absolutely correct. Thing is, Edmund Chu does have backup in terms of how to deal with this board. It does have, does have the Queen's Castle. Makes you wonder if the Be Prepared might have been might have been a good play on the on that board to stop the shift. But also, once the the uh, Robin Hood Champion Sherwood came out, maybe you could have Madam Medusa did traded one for one. Because now we're in a hard place because we can't really challenge these characters because they have six willpower which is just so much they're also threatening lethal here so we do have to end up be preparing anyway we're going to gain another lore off that goat but both those robin hoods were basically threatening lethal so there's a must deal with we have the queen's castle as backup but we're transferring over to kevin's turn kevin has two cards in hand one of which is a baboom so one of which is basically a uh, do nothing card the other which is a it's a Tinkerbell. I think it's a Tinkerbell, yeah. And Edmund doesn't have many things in the deck that can deal with Tinkerbell, but does find that Turnbox Follower and attach it, going to draw an additional card for that turn, plus quest with that Turnbox Followers, banish it, and draw an additional card past that. We do see Bucky, and here comes the Tinkerbell discard trigger. It's going to get that big... This is a huge play from Kevin here. Not only does it take off the turn of box, it gets the last card out of Edmund Chu's hand as well. Yeah, as I went down that rabbit hole of what was going on, I forgot that the Tinkerbell was actually going to get rid of that turn of box, which is really bad. We pass back, and we're going to quest for three. And it looks like it's going to be Kevin's game here. Yeah, up to 19 from Kevin here. Edmund's going to be tasked with taking care of everything plus a location. I don't know if he's going to be able to do all that. I think that's only a, yeah, I was going to say, it's a snake and the friends from the other side. So let's draw some cards. Maybe we hit something, but I don't know what it is we're going to hit that we get us out of this mini Sisu into yep. a, yep, pick up our cards. We're going to be going into game two. And I believe that was with Edmund on the play. That's super, super relevant as we look at the three-game set. Edmund doesn't win the game on the play, has to win the one on the draw now, and then ultimately game three.
players going to be sculpting their hands here. How aggressively are you, are you changing your opening hand with these decks? Very aggressively as the Ruby Amethyst player, you need to find that brawl. Um, if you don't find it in the first seven, there's an argument to throw back all seven, but you could be throwing back five or six. Basically, you're going to be looking at a lot of cards in your deck. It does have the brawl in the opener there. It's just Diablo is just a month's editor. It's not that brawl is a good card. Brawl is actually kind of a not good card. It's it doesn't trade. It doesn't trade up. It's it's not a great raid. It doesn't hit uh, too many things in the metagame. It can be a dead card. But Diablo is such a good card that you need four of these in your deck. And if you look at the top 14 cards, to hand and you're 68% to see it. And if you look even more than that, considering the turn one and turn two draw especially when you're on the draw, you're even more likely to see it. I'm trying to keep up with the math here. Look, I've got pen and paper. I'm trying to do the, what do you call them, the geometric calculations? <laughs> the something. The something, yeah. Like, I need the whole matrix drawn out for me here because I'm not very good at math. I run out of fingers and toes at some point and can't keep up. The secret is I just say it fast and make it up. You just say it with confidence, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Nobody, nobody actually questions the, uh, the random numbers that get thrown out. No one's checking the math. That's what you're trying to say. Okay. I'll ballpark the math as being quite good to find Brawl. Okay. 68%. All right. Nice. At least. Yeah. All right. So over here, we do have Edmund inking. Inking a Flynn Rider here as well in turn one. Interesting. Potentially, I had it mixed up last round. Maybe Kevin was on the play. So, oh, no, because Edmund lost. Yeah, I'm so used to two-game form. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a change here today. We're going into the best of three. Now, we get another turn one Diablo here, so setting up for those possible super crazy turn twos that make this deck so oppressive and oh. why it's so good. If Kevin has another Bucky, my Which goodness. he does. Oh, look. Crisis averted. <laughs> the, the, the Diablo quested here, meaning that he doesn't have the shift line of the Diablo here. And Edmund's going to be breathing a little bit of a sigh of relief. And these are the cards that he needs in the matchup, right? The ones that he gets to play early that also replace themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you want, like we talked about earlier, you want to prioritize that card draw because you need to be able to get to those higher ink amounts so you can actually utilize the cards that potentially come off the top of your deck if you do end up discarding your entire hand at some point in the game because that is what the sort of Bucky play line does. Bucky with these Floodborns, we're going to see that right now with the Aladdin. Another trigger, Trinder Box Followers, goes to the Banish Zone. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, Maleficent was in these decks originally, but I had seen them kind of fall out of favor, and then sort of come back lately, and I wonder if it's because of this matchup. And if you want to talk a lot about a little bit of math, a lot of math that's going on in the Ruby Amethyst deck building community is, do you play four one drops, or do you play eight? It looks like Edmund is playing eight. That puts you at about 90% to find a one drop on the first turn of the game, depending on how aggressively you sculpt that hand. I'm a pretty big fan of it. I, I like having the extra one drops in the deck. I like just getting on the board as quickly as possible in a lot of your matchups. For sure, and it looked drinkable. It's great. Aladdin went ahead and challenged that Maleficent. Took it down. It's got going to be left over just a little bit of damage. Jafar as well here from Kevin, triggering the Bucky, putting a goat into the discard pile of Edmund. Yeah, a lot of discard, but Edmund has everything he needs in terms of the Merlin Rabbit plus the multiple friends on the other side. We actually have a backup in hand again. We're going to go ahead and bounce that back, draw another card. And here we go, back up to three. We're going to see a Friends on the other side draws two cards. So that discard doesn't look too good when you're drawing. But how many cards have we drawn that turn? Five? I think, yeah, I think it's been like seven cards over the last two turns. This is the best I've ever seen Friends on the other side look. Sometimes I'm not a huge fan of it in some of these matchups, but in this one it can shine. If you can get anything that can sing it to stay in play and then get some extra value off of it, like you saw that turn with the Madame Mim, huge play there, a huge turn for Edmund. Yep, and we see the green still committing to the board like it does. So as we get up to that six ink, that seven ink, any relevant threat is going to be that big card. One thing that Edmund does have that regular or other Ruby Amethyst lists do not have is could potentially play the Sisu and actually shift the eight cost Sisu on top of that, uh, which would hit some of this board. The thing is, is a lot of a lot of the characters that Kevin has currently committed to board actually have three strength and not two. Um, but still something to keep in mind. That is a card that is not usually included in the Ruby Amethyst list, and Edmund actually spoke to its success in the interview, talked about how unexpected some of the opponents would be and how good the card has been on the weekend. Yeah, I wonder if how many surprises have, like, how many times he surprised his opponents with it to get a, a nice victory out of that. Uh, that is a Robin Hood out of Kevin. It's going to trigger the Bucky, get another card from Edmund here, and he's going to quest up here just a little bit be, as well. Be prepared off the top as we're at five ink. We're going to ink up to six. That means turn after this, we have access to be prepared, assuming no Ursula. A really heads-up play, if accessible to Kevin, would potentially be that Ursula um, coming down. I not I don't have the list in front of me, so I'm not sure if he has opted to cut that card, but could be very impactful at that six ink, taking that away, because that is a great out for Edmund now. 
Now, that's something that I've come into contact with in this matchup is sometimes when I have Ursula, I don't always just run it out there early in the game. I don't always do it on turns two or turn three if I have anything else to do. And sometimes I find myself wanting to save it before the seven ink turn of Edmund. Is that something that you think should be done in this matchup sometimes? It's contextual, but I think it's absolutely correct in many scenarios because you're actually increasing the chance that they have it in their hand because they can't get rid of it. Um, and that's when it's going to be impactful. Also, your turn two plays are in the form of Bucky are just stronger than playing that Ursula unless you're trying to snag some of their friends on the other side. So if you have the opportunity to and if it is ink efficient absolutely second copy of bucky location in hand as well from kevin here and i don't know what the last card is i wonder if the the discard finally stops here this turn there's the location gonna move a bunch of the things to the location and we're gonna quest up with the whole crew here getting that nice significant lore lead early for kevin here kind of like last game but it looks like we're going into be prepared zone here this turn as well from evan see what he's gonna put in for his seventh ink Yes, yeah, so all those those counters that we're seeing are representing everything at the cove here. That location does not gain passive lore turn by turn. We are at the seven ink. We have the be prepared. We also have the Merlin Rabbit on board. She might look to quest here. We're going to quest up to one for Edmund Chu, and surely the be prepared comes. There it is. Draw trigger for Edmund. A brawl going to the ink zone as well. A card that could be relevant when the 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 new cards from Kevin here comes up. See how he wants to rebuild from this position. Maybe something that could come in, but I think we're getting to the point where the, the six, sevens, and eights are going to start coming out of Edmund's decks. Yeah, so the eight cost Sisu makes it a bit of a free roll to get rid of that brawl because it's going to hit the same targets, but it's also going to area of effect hit them, so it'll hit multiple targets. Um, it, is, it is very expensive, and, you know, it does not things like Tinkerbell, but I think you can go ahead and get rid of a lot of those brawls now. Um, and also Diablo in this later game is a lot less impactful when you have access to things like Madame Medusa and be prepared. A very authoritative play from Kevin there. Going to go ahead and put that... Tinkerbell into play, but that cove is going to get taken out by the Maui here. A nice little spot for Edmund to get some value off the Maui and into a Maleficent going to draw another card. Kevin's dealing with, what is that, six cards in his hand after all of these Bucky triggers? And there is that Diablo off the top four. Kevin Edmund is firmly in the driver's seat here. Yeah, it looks like that Diablo is going to get deployed here this turn, and there are some answers waiting on the other side of the board for Edmund. Yep, so the two, uh, the two of S Sisu likely to hit the field this turn. And there we go, we're t eight ink exerted, and we're gonna go ahead and get rid of that Diablo, so just the Tinkerbell. And it, it is it is just, uh, at this point, almost a fundamental fact that Edmund's deck can navigate this game a lot better than Kevin's from this position at this stage of the game with this amount of ink. Yeah, I love this uh, quest from Maleficent here, daring Kevin to send his Tinkerbell in to challenge it, because he's got this Maui sitting there waiting to take out this Tinkerbell. At the end of the day, it's so it's, it's like not a great exchange for Edmund, but be, it's it's just a game plan of attrition. Edmund is so far up on card advantage that he can he can afford to take inefficient trades, and that is a fundamentally inefficient trade, um, because Kevin does not have access to a draw engine that is remotely close to Edmund's at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of good draw engines, that's a castle off the top from Edmund here, and he just put four ink off to the side. I wonder if that's something he's thinking about deploying. This turn's got a brawl that's come to the front of his hand here as well. Maybe he wants to start taking care of this Ursula sitting on the other side of the board. So we're going to start, though, with getting a little bit of lore, trying to make that lead a little bit better. Edmund at six, Kevin at nine. Brawl's going to make it into the ink zone here. Let's see, what is this? Is this a Madam? Madam Medusa, just sort of a tempo play, is going to hit that Ursula. Potentially, okay, on exert, so he might be thinking about the castle here in that case. Yeah, I think he has 10 ink here, and I was going to say, Madam into either goat or castle seems pretty good, but it looks like he might lead off with the goat here. Does he have any ways to bounce this? I kind of like the castle being played here because okay, there although there's five strength represented by Kevin, it is simply not enough for the castle, and then you move move potentially a lot of these, uh, these characters to that castle, draw additional cards in your turn, and you are in a fantastic spot to win this game. And this is a really good play from Edmund here. He's putting two different characters into this. So the odds of Kevin being able to take care of both of these characters since they can't be challenged is obscenely low. Yeah, both unexerted characters. So we're going to go ahead and hit that with Let the Storm Rage on. Then Tinkerbell will challenge a character on board and deal two more damage to that goat. There's going to be a trigger for Lore here on the side of Edmund. Very efficient trade for Kevin there. That's a that's a very good start to the turn, but it does look like that Ma Maui's going to stick around to draw those extra cards, though. Yep, was a very good draw with the Let the Storm Rage on from Kevin. Yeah, Jafar is going to be the last card out of Kev Kevin's hand after putting that card into his ink. Well, Edmund firmly up here on cards, and they're even in lore. you got to believe he's in the driver's chief of this game. Two more cards to his hand here because of the Maui. Yep, both of those cards also replace themselves. And we're going to potentially... Yep, we're going to see the Madame Medusa take out that Jafar. 
and we're going to use quest with this Maleficent broom. And then I can only imagine what is turn a box followers, banish the broom. Oh, we actually leave the broom for the quest value. Makes sense. I guess we have the castle. So moving all of these to castle, we're just going to draw so many cards. And that's probably one of the worst top decks for Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one was not very good. And it looks like we got a very firm, firm win here in game two. How are you feeling about the chances for and yeah, we haven't seen that from Kevin. You know, we could have something like a Diabolus stick around for a couple turns. We haven't seen Daffy Duck do as much as we have in, say, some of his prior matchups. I've seen Daffy do some really powerful things. We haven't seen, you know, Ursula double sing a song yet or anything like that. So maybe some of those, you know, mid games. Is that a full seven from yeah, Kevin? It's a full seven, which you love to see as Edmund. Edmund also six, but six is very standard for the Ruby Amethyst deck. The, uh, the Emerald Steel deck is looking for a combination of cards, where the Ruby Amethyst deck is more looking for a singular card in terms of, like, very powerful opener and then answer to said very powerful opener. So in that position, you know, with no information on the hand, I'd be a lot more comfortable in Edmund's position rather than Kevin's with that sort of hand sculpting. That being said, Edmund is going to finally be on the draw, and Kevin is going to be the active player who's going to play first. I do see a Diablo in hand as well. I think Brawl was the only card that Edmund kept, by the way. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, yeah, you're really looking for the brawl, but also wants to find potentially the one drops in the draw engine. We do see a friend on the other side. I wonder if we're going to see an Ursula potentially come down on turn two instead of a Bucky, a Bucky to snag that friend on the other side. Yeah, really nice to have the Diablo on turn one to see the hand to see if you want to jam this Ursula in turn two or keep it for that be prepared like we talked about a lot earlier. It does look like a turn of box followers is going to be the play here on turn one. Back over to Kevin. Interested to see if we see the shift Diablo without the Bucky here. Hmm. Let's see. We're going to go ahead and play that baboom. So that does stop the Chernobyl's followers from replacing itself, which was surely the plan of Edmund. It does trade one for one, though, so not ideal for Kevin. Kevin having a much, much, much lower start than usual. This does keep him from keeping some of this, this card advantage away from him, though. He doesn't get to turn the Chernobyl's follower in a card. Now, if he wants, he's got this turn. He can use Ursula to take care of the friends from the other side. Away from Edmund. You know, he's got at least a turn before he's going to do that. And maybe Edmund's going to play a three drop here and try to sing it the next turn. So you have a little bit of time before you need to do that. Yeah, definitely. It is It is. It is a one-for-one one trade. And um, if I'm playing Emerald Steel, it's one of the last things I want to do against the Ruby Amethyst deck is trade on parity with cards. That's why we th see cards like Bucky get so gets so much card advantage. But still, you know, Ruby Amethyst can't find a way to actually grind through that speaks to the the draw the power level and the draw engine of this Ruby Amethyst deck. And speaking of something that's important here, not only we get that shift of Diablo this turn, that's going to get a little bit of card advantage because it was labeled to oh. quest right away. Getting it to the Cove adds the strength to it, and that kind of is important, right? It's more than kind of important. It's massively important. So uh, <laughs> Edmund was waiting with, with the Brawl there, was ready to go, but that Cove completely changed the context of that. It is now has three strength, and it cannot no longer be targeted by the Brawl. We're actually going to see kind of see our first Diablo that goes unanswered, and that is a scary, scary thing. Let's see. How much strength does the Seahood have? I think it has three strength right now, so no easy way to take care of that just yet. Yeah, it needs to find a way to deal with the Cove. I yeah, think, I was going to say the Cove. Had a Maui in hand, but it's not going to come down turn turn five. So, I mean, if we talk about card advantage and value, this, this Diablo will accrue so many more cards than are actually going to be invested into it. So it's, it's great. Even if, even if next turn we do find a way to deal with the Cove, not only is it potentially not Edmund's ideal sort of play pattern, but it also, we put it, we're in a position where on turn six, we're playing something like a Madame Medusa. We wouldn't even play the Brawl on the Diablo. We'd probably play the Madame Medusa at that point, which, so this Brawl just kind of sits in hand. So that was an incredible play with the Cove. It's, su it's such a good sequence from Kevin, especially in the context that Edmund was firmly in the driver's seat and firmly ahead before that play specifically. Yeah, now we see the Bucky making it into the Inkwell here to play yet another way to get these extra cards in the form of Beast. Yeah, so that card is a problem. <laughs> that, is a, that is a problem for Edmund. And Beast is so much more powerful on the play than it is on the draw because Ruby Amethyst going into its turn five cannot answer the Beast. Actually, has to wait until turn six, and then it needs Madame Medusa to have an answer. So assuming it has the Madame Medusa, we're actually going to see um, multiple activations of the Beast, which is just so hard to deal with. Put that on top of the, the uh, Diablo, and now we're starting to see the secondary game plan of Kevin. I talked about this deck being able to grind. Who, look at this Look at this matchup. Who's the card advantage deck now? Yeah, exactly. I was say, now, look, we're starting to go where you were talking about. That was a castle getting put in the ink well there. Maui's going to go ahead and take out that location from Kevin. So that's going to slow down just a little bit. No more strength added to Diablo. So possibly next turn, Madame Medusa coming in to take care of Beast. Maybe gets a double spell of Brawl plus something else. We'll have to see. 
And the hits just keep coming for Kevin. I see a Robin Hood. I think I see another Diablo. This Emerald Steel deck can really, really cause some problems. Absolutely. Edmund is in a tough position here. Does theoretically have the answers in hand. Also has double draw, which I'm sure he's going to likely sing with the Maui if that beast does not get exerted. So sing friends on the other side, play Madame Medusa on the beast, and I think deal with the Diablo on a on a future turn with that brawl. So I'm waiting till probably turn seven at the earliest to actually be able to deal with the Diablo. Very, very tough. Uh, w with the Diablo in play, if it gets exerted, are you actually maybe possibly not using Friends on the other side to, just to deny a few cards? That's a good point. You're probably right that Friends on the other side. It just depends. Do you need to draw yourself into an answer is the question. Depends on Inkables in the hand, but that's a good observation. Yeah, Kevin down to one card. Goes up to two because of Diablo. It does look like it is going to be Brawl into a second spell here. Yeah, so it makes a better case for actually... Um, so it's, it's quite inefficient to on turn six to actually play that brawl and then play the friends on the other side. So Edmund showing why he's he's sitting there playing games and we're, we're sitting here talking about him. Well, he, Edmund has a lot of friends here. He went to the friends on the other side twice that turn. So tons of cards out of his hand. I see it be prepared in there as well. But that beast still in play for Kevin here. Still got the Diablo. Still has a ton of ways to get extra cards. I see another Bucky to the end. But boom, added to the ink wall here. Up to seven. We're going to start out with another form of Diablo. Quest with this one. Oh, now Ed it's exerted. Edmund is going to be very happy to be prepared. This board state, I can only imagine. Yeah, so card added to Kevin's hand as well here this turn off of that Diablo, but we're going to get some of that advantage back here. Be prepared. does take care of our own Maui, but it takes out two Diablos. Speaking the way you talked about earlier, the Maui did not sink friends into the side because the Diablo was exerted. And that would have been, you know, assuming Diablo is not exerted, that would have absolutely been the play prior to be prepared coming down. So we do actually have a discard trigger here with the Bucky into, into the... Robin Hood, Champion of Sherwood, but Edmund has the perfect answer. Edmund well, listen, has the Madame Medusa. I was going to say, this is a really, really nice reload for Kevin here, but like you said, Edmund's waiting in the wings here. I think a Maleficent was just added to hand, but this looks like here comes the Madame. Kevin knew this was coming. He's like, yeah, you're, you're making six ink, exerting six ink that fast. My Robin Hood is not long for this world. Oh, but Kevin actually has the Ursula. He's going to take a look at the hand, snag one of those friends on the other side. We do have double. But you can only imagine a discard trigger is going to come after that, so we're going to have to get rid of another card, Oof. probably getting rid of this Maleficent Sorceress, so we're going to have to sing Friends on the other side. Almost lost all the cards in hand, which would have been quite devastating since we're relying on that draw pack. It's just find the Be Prepared. Oh, there's a Be Prepared off the top. Huge draw for Edmund here, followed by a Chernobyl follower and a Madame Mim as well. Huge draw here for Edmund. Ink? So three. So where he is has it? seven. Okay, so could actually ink that Chernobyl followers, bounce back the Madame Medusa, and play it again, right? That was an option. But, of ba course, it, the, the be prepared is a three-for-one. So. Yeah. Nice three-for-one here. And was that just a pass from Kevin back over to Edmund with no plays? Oh, I believe so. All right, turn to box follower. So not a huge play from Edmund as well. It looks like Ursula. Take a look. That's a miss. That's a Maui and a Madam Mim. Looks like we have a Baboom. And I can't see the other card quite yet for Kevin. But Kevin is in a really tough spot, and there's a Strength of the Raging Fire. That's actually pretty good right here. It's not great. Kevin's hand is still very, very rough, but stopping that draw is very important. We do see the Sisu. Okay, right. so the game has started to slow a bit in pace. Yeah, and now these players, unfortunately for Kevin, he's drawing a lot of his cheaper cards here. He's drawing his one-cost Robin Hood here. Yeah, Kevin really wanted to find Beast Tragic here on that draw step, almost oh. surely. Rabbit, a huge draw here as well with this Madame Mim. This is going to draw so many extra cards. Absolutely massive. What a top deck. That be prepared was so good Oof. off the top earlier. And now we find a Cove once again in the late game, which is not... Cove can be so impactful, and we've seen that. Cove is just such a strong card. We've seen it be impactful in other matchups as well, but it is almost... It's, it's hard to deny that it is a, a good top deck in the late game. That is where it struggles. Yeah, a lot of the locations can be pretty... Uh you know, I, I like Castle kind of almost at any point in the game. That one's just so powerful. But some of these other locations are not the best when you draw them in the late game. But this Madame Mim with this uh, this Merlin Rabbit off the top of the last couple turns was really good, too. So but Boom's going to put two damage on the Madame Mim. So taking that card out of hand, maybe reducing the attack um, of that Sisu as well. Yep, the Shrink went down to one, and that's a double trade, double challenge into, into Sisu here to getting it off the board. Madame Mim still staying around, though. Oh, man, we found a Madame Mim Fox. It doesn't get any better than that. We're going to go ahead and draw a card here. We've got the Madame Mim Snake off the top. We've got the whole entire draw engine going. We're bouncing it back. We have Rush. We're able to attack into that code. We're actually going to remove it this turn. And you see Edmund pull farther and farther ahead in this match. 
Yeah, and is this where the deck really starts to sing, really starts to hum, is when you get to this much ink and then you start to have all of your bounce stuff? 100%. We see Let the Storm Rage On as the top deck for Kevin. Going to go ahead and potentially remove one of these characters. No, just deal two more damage. Gives himself the out of potentially top decking something like a Tinkerbell. Yeah, I like I like playing for your best possible draws there and playing for a Tink top deck would have been really good here. Ursula. They'll snag the Be Prepared, which is non-zero. That's something. Looks like the double double challenge here is going to remove all the characters, but except for the Ursula from the board. But Kevin, no cards in hand. Edmund, a full grip as we go into his turn. Finds another rabbit. And so is this where Edmund's deck really starts to pull away? Is the fact that if it gets to a top deck war, he's got sixes, sevens, and eights, while Kevin can sometimes draw ones? Yeah, 100%. Ruby Amethyst does have better top decks than Emerald Steel as we get into the late game. And oh, that's a pretty good one. It's okay. I think that if you need anything, you need Beast Tragic Hero to draw more cards. Um, you also need Beast Tragic Hero without a immediate follow-up with something like a Madame Medusa. does find a Brawl at the top here for Edmund. An embarrassment of riches here, actually, for Edmund. Brawl, I'll say tons of other cards in his hand that could take care of anything that Kevin could do here as well. I see like, a Maui. There's a Madame Mim picking up a rabbit. We're going to be drawing tons of extra cards here. Another Maui added to the hand. Ad Edmund... This is almost getting embarrassing. It's a pure be prepared head in here. I I don't I don't like to call games before they're over, but I think Kevin's gonna have a really hard time getting back into this one. I mean, we're just watching the Ruby Ham of this deck hum at this point. We we get that Queen's Castle off the top. That Queen's Castle is surely going to cement this lead on the following turn cycle. Robin Hood is gonna get to go ahead and challenge here. Take yes. care of some take yeah. care of that character, get a little bit of a lore. Yep, will be a trigger on that. We do see a Jafar, which is a pretty decent threat to hit the to hit the field here. I just think that Edmund has built up a board here of oh, Madam right off the top here. Well, maybe, maybe not. Does Madam want to go ahead and just take care of this Jafar? Wondering if he was considering be prepared there for a second. But we do go ahead and play the Madam Medusa, hit the Robin Hood champion of Sherwood. And there's the castle that we talked about to back it up. Yeah, to say, I don't know if Edmund can lose here. Madam's going to go ahead and move over to the castle. We're going to lore up quite a bit here. The, the lore was at a, quite a disparity. I think it was 10 to 1 at the start of the turn. Now it's 10 to 5, but I think that's going to start jumping every single turn on Edmund's side. Okay, Kevin, I'm going to go ahead and draw a card as well off that Jafar trigger. We're going to redeploy with a with a Tinkerbell. One damage onto the characters of Edmund here. But now we're going to go to Edmund's turn. We're going to see that Queen's Castle trigger, so we're going to draw two cards for the turn as well as gain two lore. Yep. Lower count up, draw two cards for the turn, and man, this deck is really humming from here. A broom added to hand. Another bounce card. I wonder if it's even going to hit the rabbit at this point. Yeah, man. All right, you gotta rearrange. This is what you know it's gonna be. Let me rearrange all my ink, make sure I know exactly how much I have, because I have so many options. And Kevin's sitting over there with one card in hand or two cards in hand every turn, being like, I'm just playing what I've got. Yeah, and this, at this stage, Kevin just has to play to his outs. And even if Kevin looks at looks at the current uh, sort of uh, state of the fee, you know of the game, realizes that that out may not exist. At that point, you just keep playing and hope you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when you're in this situation, you you can't look for monsters under the bed. You have to just act like it doesn't exist. You have to play to your outs, play to win. You can't play not to lose from this point. And look, Madam Mims, number two coming in, picking up a rabbit, going to draw an extra card, another broom added to hand. Here comes back that same rabbit. I believe. Oh, wait. Yep, there comes back the same rabbit. And there is a Madam Mib Fox off the top as well to bounce that rabbit back. I mean, the way these cards are coming off the top for Edmund, I wonder if he could just draw his entire deck. Just with, looping this, this Merlin rabbit. With the way some of these cards are going off against uh, off the top of Edmund's deck, I don't know if anyone can stop him yeah. in this challenge. Picking up the rabbit yet again, draw another card. Sisu added the hand here. Just an in pure embarrassment of riches. Yep, Madam Mim going to go ahead and Challenge into Jafar here. Take that off the board. And we have a double move to the Queen's Castle. So looking to draw four cards at the start of Edmund's turn. Going to go ahead and ink that one drop broom. Does he, does he have a turtle box followers here as well? He might as well. Or no, sorry, another broom here as well. Back over to Kevin. Yep. Kevin does find that beast tragic hero, but too little too late, I think, in this situation. Yeah, also no uh, character for Tinkerbell to challenge here, so it doesn't get to you know pick off a nice little two-for-one. Yep, Edmund casually going to his draw step, and it's going to be a four cards Sisu. off the top. I think Sisu, Goat, Sisu, Maleficent. Goat, Maleficent, Broom. Yep, pretty good. To add to the full grip that he already had. We'll say here, okay, now, now I think this is where we start to wrap it up. Go yep. ahead and quest up to 13, 14. Does he, as I say, is this going to be a be prepared into something? Yeah, just go ahead and clean up. 
This is when you're like, look, I'm losing out on this Be Prepared. It's a five for two, and I'm completely okay with completely this. Completely okay with it. That's that's where the card advantage comes into play, is that you can trade down but still be ahead. And this is when you know you uh, everything's over but the crying, when the goat starts to come in, and we're going to get to start questing up with that. Broom behind that as well. Move it over to the castle. Goes up to 15 lore. This might be the last card Kevin draws in does, this challenge. Does find the namesake Diablo the name of this tournament. A good send-off to, uh, to, to Emerald Steel here. We have Diablo and Jafar hitting the field, and we're going to draw two cards off this queen's castle. And Up to 17, 18, 19 lore. Does he have a goat or a way to bounce a goat? The game would be over, and it looks like we do. Second just, goat. Another goat. Nice little fist bump from Kevin there. I loved the camaraderie between these two. You know, they've been seeing each other all weekend long. They were getting some nice little fist bumps in between the games there. Kind of, I love seeing the sportsmanship between the two because that's one of my favorite things about Lorcana, watching all of these matches and the players are saying good games afterwards, you know, good luck in the rest of the tournament. And they really genuinely mean it. I mean, honestly, I just can't be more impressed by Edmund. Just such a good player, such an expert of Ruby Amethyst. We've seen him navigate these matchups flawlessly is going into a very hard match. We talked about Emerald Steel being a hard matchup. Historically, Steel Song, Amber Steel, is one of Ruby Amethyst's hardest matchups in the game. It did sort of fall out of the metagame for a while, but has researched back in this tournament, was actually more played than Ruby Sapphire, and now we have two in the semifinals and one going to the finals. Yeah, absolutely, and those finals are coming right around the corner, so I can't wait to see them. I know you can't wait to see them, so at home we're going to be taking a real quick break, and we'll be back with more Lorcana right after this.